um, and understanding where Project 13 came from. So as Melissa said, Project 13 is an industry-led movement. Um, it, it, it aims to improve the way infrastructure is delivered. Um, and in headline terms, it advocates moving from transactional approaches to more integrated collaborative models. So it's about bringing together the right capabilities, the right technologies into integrated enterprises. The, the primary focus is to improve the way infrastructure is delivered, uh, but also to, to do this by building a more sustainable and progressive future for, for construction, something which we'll talk about when we look at the business case of Project 13. Uh, as an industry movement, uh, it really does involve and benefits from a wide range of bodies and organisations, uh, all of which are making a real contribution to Project 13 as it develops. But it's also important to recognise that infrastructure owners are the key sponsors of Project 13. Um, yeah, that's important because it, it's about recognising the changes promoted by Project 13 come from and are ultimately owned by uh, infrastructure owners, um, particularly the infrastructure client group. So if we go on to, to, to look at the infrastructure plan group, um, two, two key parts to that role. Firstly, to identify, consolidate and share best practice, which sounds really simple, but, but is a real significant step for our industry. Open, transparent, shared learning across our sector is um, driving change and improvement. So you know, simple process around best practice will in, it, in itself become a step change. And we'll come back and look at how this approach to best practice is actually the starting point for Project 13. Second key role for the infrastructure client group is to provide a single voice for industry. Um, as I touched on, it, it's made up of, of, of primarily of infrastructure owners, but it does have representation from the key industry bodies and, and leaders from across our sector. Current programme, um, Melissa mentioned the Project 13 was so, some time ago part of a long list. The current program is five key areas. Uh, what, what's the owner's role in terms of driving health, safety and well-being? Uh, new delivery models, which is about Project 13 and risk. Digital transformation. Sustainability, which is about how do we drive carbon and equality, diversity and inclusion. So of those, those key areas, it's Project 13 that we're going to look at in, in more detail. So. The business case of Project 13 really has three main aspects. Um, so it's just good, good to understand how these uh, demand a, a new delivery model. Firstly, improving underlying productivity. So the, gra the graph there shows uh, construction productivity relative to other sectors. And while productivity in those other best practice sectors has been running at about 2 to 3% a year, construction has been pretty much flat over a 20 year period. Um, we can argue about the margins, uh, but what you know is pretty unarguable is construction runs completely out of step with other sectors. So, you know, we really do need to improve productivity performance. Secondly, uh, the sustainability issues within our industry. So, the, the graph on the top right shows data from the farm report, suggests in the past ten years, main contracting organisations have generated margins not much more than one percent. And the reality is that that it's our absolute emphasis on cost-based competition as a core part of improvement that has actually generated a pretty dysfunctional approach where the emphasis is actually more on turnover uh, and on cash than it is on genuine return. Uh, and you know, clearly that, that, that creates sustainability issues, some of which have been pretty high profile, but, but also significantly it reduces any opportunity for investment in innovation and future skills. So you know, in part locks us into that, that low productivity performance that we just talked about. So those are two things that we, we really need to improve. The third is actually an opportunity that we really have to take, and that's the opportunity presented by digital transformation. And while digital is integrating everything from data, teams, organisations, our traditional approach to how we engage creates interfaces, creates handoffs, and views delivery as an in-series activity. So the reality is that, that you know, we need a delivery model that's fit for a di digital future, you know, one that enables us to really take the opportunity digital transformation presents. So those, those three points really are the business case of Project 13. And having agreed the need to, to bring forward an initiative around delivery models, a team was, was developed, um, brought together to look at current exemplar projects drawn from across infrastructure. The team included uh, and was led by University College London, but included professionals and practitioners, and they undertook a detailed analysis of those projects, both you know, exemplar projects and core projects. 
and aggregated the characteristics that they saw in those projects to define the overall approach advocated by Project 13. So this is, this is really important because Project 13 is not some future hypothesis or some future theory. It is actually drawn from current industry best practice. And what we mustn't allow ourselves to do is to just position this house at some point in the future and think it's something that will apply in a number of years' time. This is current industry best practice. So the next slide just really provides a, a summary of the shift that's advocated by Project 13, which is one from a tra traditional transactional approach to one where we develop more integrated and collaborative enterprises to deliver our projects and our programs. So what this research show? Well, the traditional approach is about linear relationships between clients, consultants, contractors, relationships that, that almost invariably form through some competition around work or scope. Um, and one where those relationships are often adversarial, you know, where we create behaviours around gaming, where we create behaviours that are related to client, contractor, parent, child dynamics. Um, so a model that actually does quite an effective job of creating a number of value destroying behaviours. It also pays little regard to the extended supply chain. And generally, if you look across infrastructure, over 50% of what we spend lies outside these primary relationships, as does much of the value um, and much of the potential for innovation. So you know, in general terms, that, that's the approach we're trying to get away from. What enterprises do is bring together the right organisations in integrated collaborative teams, enterprises that are engaged to deliver outcomes, not to deliver work, a point that we'll come back to a number of times, and with reward models that are therefore outcome focused. Project 13 promotes new roles, talks about owners, integrators, advisors, suppliers, and it absolutely recognises that wider ecosystem with an emphasis on engaging organisations wherever they are in that ecosystem when they can add greatest value. So this is a real shift away from our hierarchical in-series notion of delivery and the, you know, the associated hierarchical language we're all used to, like tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, Project Three also recognises, again, it seems quite simple, but the need to create the right environment for enterprises and integrated teams to operate. And, and, and within this, it you know, recognises the importance of enabling um, positive value-adding behaviours. So that's the general direction for Project 13. Um, there, there are really three main parts to the framework. They are, uh, firstly, five pillars, which we'll come back to in a minute, um, a set of key principles, and really that's, that's primarily what we're going to talk about in, in this webinar, and then the recognition that, that this is about increasing maturity, again, which I'll, I'll come back to at the end. So that, that's the framework for Project 13, five pillars, set of principles, and, and a, a recognition of increasing levels of maturity. So we come back and, and look at those briefly um, in terms of the five pillars. These are organisation, governance and integration. So that the areas that the, the, the research on these exemplar projects highlighted, these are essential capability, capability areas and, and fundamental when we're looking to secure better outcomes through an enterprise. And then digital transformation and capable owners are the enablers that over time really set the pace of change and deliver improvement. All the principles that we're going to walk through in the next few minutes relate back to these five key pillars. So if I go on to the, the principle slide, and we'll walk through each of these five, five areas and explain you know, what, what the principles really uh, promote and advocate within Project 13. Um, and I will touch on, you, you know, as we go through many of these principles, then you, you know, they sound fairly common sense. Um, and actually, it's not until we think about the change that's required that we realise how these do represent fundamental changes and challenges for our industry. So in terms of capable owner, um, so the owner develops enterprises built on long-term relationships. So those traditional hierarchical relationships I talked about are replaced with aligned business-to-business -business relationships. And it's business-to-business -business relationships that will provide the foundation for an enterprise. Um, and with that enterprise, provides a collective focus on delivering outcomes. Uh, so in order to, to enable this earlier engagement, it, it's almost inevitable that the right partners will be selected through capability and behaviours, not, not through cost and scope. And those partners will work with an incentivised 
value-based arrangement. So enterprises brought together to deliver the outcomes required, whether they're customer or societal outcomes, um, to enable the owner's business by delivering asset performance, enterprises are not brought together to deliver defined work. And it's this focus on outcomes that really provides the basis for alignment and back-to-back -back relationships through, through all parts of the enterprise. Alignment really is a key ingredient of, of an enterprise approach. And the best way, the most effective way to create alignment is to actually engage at outcome level. So a principle around um, enterprises being set up to deliver outcomes sounds fairly simple, but actually in itself is a significant change. So as part of that, a capable owner uh, must have the capability to articulate the, these outcomes, which means having processes in place to ensure the outcomes effectively represent the requirements of customers, community and society. So that, you know, that becomes a core business process for a capable owner. Uh, capable owners should be able to articulate the outcomes, they should be able to describe the asset performance required to deliver those outcomes, and then they're able to engage with partners in delivering outcomes and asset performance. So you, you can start to see an entirely different approach to how um, we engage and, and, and develop relationships. So those are some of the principles behind capable owner. If we look at governance, um, I, guess, I guess firstly an enterprise should be enabled by, by effective governments in, in exactly the same way as any organisation through should. Um, an approach that's based on integration and collaboration still has to be enabled by good governance. And I think sometimes our industry has learned some lessons about thinking collaboration reduces the need for some of this fundamental framework. The principles of good corporate governance apply equally to an enterprise. Uh, a couple of things they should obviously include. That, that, that start to describe this difference. Um, integrated processes that provide effective collective decision making. Um, you know, again, very different from a traditional client contractor dynamic. And high degrees of transparency that are supported by a combination of, of independent assurance, owner assurance and self-assurance. So enterprises you will be characterised by, by significantly different degrees of transparency to our traditional environment. Uh, within, within this governance, value should be defined at outcome level. So that might be benchmarks, it might be baselines, it might be customer affordability for those outcomes. Um, but providing uh, this baseline and, and using that as a definition of value and using that as a point of engagement is an important part of, of enterprise governance. Value in enterprise is not defined through some cost-based competition for the delivery of defined scope or work. It's defined at outcome level and by reference to some baseline. What flows out of that is that rewards for the enterprise will then be aligned with the value created. So this could in its simplest form be uh, for outperformance against those baselines or benchmark and, and, and that outperformance being the primary mean of re, means of return to the partners. That may could be a more sophisticated model for return that, that comes from generating outcome value. But this back-to-back -back commercial arrangement is a really important step in creating aligned relationships. From the outset and in, in an enterprise, the owner and the enterprise partners have to be commercially aligned. Um, the enterprise requires quite a significant change in our, our traditional approach to risk. So in headline terms, risk is not transferred. Uh, specific risks are identified uh, together with the capabilities required to manage them. So that, that whole Identification of risk and understanding of capability becomes a core process. Uh, risk can be allocated through the commercial model um, and they become part of the relationships where possible with incentives that encourage effective mitigation of those risks. So again, you know, risk is not, trans not, not something to be transferred and this isn't about transferring all risk back to owners, it's about understanding capability with regard to specific risks. Uh, in tackling the sustainability issues we talked about at the start, so part of the business case of Project 13, commercial arrangements in enterprise have to provide the potential for sustainable returns. I mean, in fact, an enterprise commercial model should create a shared aspiration for this sustainable return. So again, this isn't this is about partners needing a return, it's about all parts of the enterprise, including the owner, having a shared aspiration for a sustainable return. And, and when, when we do that, and flowing out of that, there then should be clear opportunities for investment in improvement um, and in future capability. So when you've got longer term relationships and when you've got reward focused on value, 
there should be clear opportunities for enterprise partners to invest in future skills and in improvement, knowing that if they're effective, that investment will be covered through increased um, outperformance as part of the, the commercial model. Uh, so that, that, those are some of the key parts of governance. And again, I stress the part, as I stressed at the start, um, governance is just as important in an enterprise as it is in any other organisation. So the next area is organisation. Uh, so a couple, couple of key principles here. So the alignment with the outcomes should extend through to key suppliers and partners. And, and there is a reality that alignment will inevitably increase with maturity and with the development of the relationships. But from the outset, even when we're forming an enterprise, that alignment should include those suppliers who have the greatest influence and impact on the outcomes to be delivered, wherever they are within that ecosystem. So supplier capability engaged early in developing solutions, um, partners that have and the suppliers that have an influence on the required outcomes should be involved from the outset of solution development when their capability has greatest impact and adds greatest value. And understanding where this capability and where this influence exists within the ecosystem and then developing engagement strategies that relate to that is actually a fundamental part of developing an effective enterprise. So understanding value and influence within an ecosystem and engaging accordingly becomes a core competence of an enterprise. And we know that the historical approach, where that engagement is all too often determined simply on the basis of the lowest price, limits the influence supplier capability can have on the ultimate solution. So again, this, this starts to represent significant change in the way we operate. Um, an enterprise should integrate the required capability in high performing collaborative teams. And again, sounds sound relatively simple, but this development and maintenance of high performing teams is a core competence in an enterprise. Bringing together best for task capability in integrated teams that aren't undermined by interfaces, by handoffs, and by the hierarchical boundaries associated with our traditional in series approach is an important characteristic of this enterprise. And as you already mentioned, again, you know, it's a really simple part enterprises actually focus on creating the right environment for these integrated teams to operate in. The next area integration. So an integrator brings together capabilities that will trans translate an effective solution into platforms and production systems through delivery. So some key aspects within this, um, it should integrate the capabilities required to progress from development of a solution through to effective production systems in delivery with an integrator brought together by understanding the required capabilities. So an integrator in any, in any relatively complex environment is not going to be a single organisation. It is going to be formed by bringing together the right capabilities. Uh, it'll be down to the integrator to establish a procurement strategy and incentivise commercial arrangements for the enterprise and then include the wider ecosystem. To integrate individual strategies into effective platform delivery, um, achieving you know, much higher levels of reliability and productivity than traditional construction. Uh, an integrator should provide management capability and systems to enable an enterprise to operate as a single integrated organisation. And again, should, should be able to build high performing integrated teams. So going back to the, the, the platform aspect, an integrator should enable a platform approach. So this is where, where digital products and components are used across the proposed solution. Um, where standardised interoperable components should enable a much more production based approach to delivery. Uh, and, and get to the point where construction increasingly looks more like manufacturing. So we, we've developed and pursued a number of initiatives around aspects like build off site, DFMA. What an integrator should be doing is bringing all those together to create an effective platform based approach to delivery. So th this, as we've touched on, requires the engagement of suppliers, this time in the development of standardized components and products. Engagement that is actually going to be outside the immediate project environment and, and where solutions then subsequently uh, are developed by just integrating pre-developed products um, to, to, to form a solution. So again, Project 13 enables us ultimately to work in a very different way. Uh, and, and, and you know, really importantly, an integrated enterprise will have a common approach to health, safety and well-being with enterprise partners sharing best practice and collectively learning through a continuous improvement process. And that's one of the things the research right at the outset flagged up was um, how effective enterprises enable 
a shared learning process around health, safety and well-being, which accelerates uh, our progress and our development. So the last of these uh, key areas, digital transformation. So an enterprise DT strategy should enable an integrated approach to delivery and to asset management. It should have common and visible information processes that connect from asset management through delivery to operations and to, to customers. And in a digital environment, delivery is focused as much on the provision of information as it is on the assets that are going to be delivered. So it's a much more information-rich approach um, you know, where we're probably far more adept at right-to-left thinking and understanding how we deliver the information requirements of customers and of an operating environment. The, the other part, a really big step, which is effectively integrating engineering and dig digital technology. So a really big step for our industry. And enterprises must effectively integrate engineering and DT to deliver intelligent solutions, to deliver smart assets. Solutions that are smart, that, that are optimized, and they use real-time information to support decision-making. So again, what, you know, what sits behind this is a real shift and, and, and a right-to-left approach where solutions first provide information, deliver an optimal customer outcome, an oper optimal operating environment, with assets actually becoming the secondary part of the process. So those, those are the, um, the, the, the principles that underpin Project 13. As I said, many of those look like common sense and, and, and you know, they're fairly easy to, to talk through. It's not till we start to think about the change that sits behind it, we realise how this is actually a really important step for our industry. And the next slide just, just picks on a couple of those key shifts. I've, I was really just going to mention four. Um, and, and, you know, I can come back to that outcome piece in one. I mean, Project 13 is absolutely about enterprises formed to deliver out Comes. This is not about delivering work, it's not about delivering scope, it's not even about delivering outputs. We're only going to create that absolute alignment and, and those aligned relationships if the point of engagement is outcomes. The second one we just touched on, uh, it was our ability to integrate digital uh, technology and engineering to form solutions. So really big one for infrastructure, You're increasingly the solutions we provide are going to be intelligent, they're going to be smart, and it will be about optimizing assets to deliver customer outcomes. It will not be about traditional approach to constructed solutions. The other one I'd pick out, again, which we touched on, uh, Project 13 requires a move away from reward models based on scope. So this is not about rewarding uh, hours or volume. It's not about rewarding turnover or spend. It's actually about recognizing value and rewarding our performance. So we start to move towards commercial models that look far more shareholder-like, small s, um, and where the focus is on value and our performance, not, not on work. Um, a really significant shift for our industry, but, but, but one um, you know, that industry bodies are really, really engaged in. And then uh, the last one, which seems fairly granular, but again, it, it has the potential to be a real blocker in terms of Project 13, uh, moving away from just transferring risk to much smarter processes where we understand risks, we understand the capabilities that manage those risks, and we somehow incentivize joint performance through a commercial model. So, you know, all, all of those do require a significant change in the way we work and, and our challenges for our industry, but it you know, will we'll, we'll take us to a much more effective model. And the last part of the framework is uh, just the maturity, which, which, which recognises, and, and there's more detail that sits behind the maturity matrix, that th this clearly isn't an overnight shift. Uh, we don't go home on a Friday working in a traditional model and, and turn up on Monday and we're all working in high performance enterprises. It is a journey. Um, it's one that progresses through simple collaboration into more integrated ways of working and ultimately into high performing enterprises that, that, that match the characteristics that I've just walked through. And I, and I think you know, recognising that, that, that it is a journey allows all of us to, to get on and embark on a change process, recognising that, that, that you know, this isn't something we can achieve in a short space of time, but it is a journey we can start immediately. So those are really the, the, the key parts of the framework I wanted to, to walk through. Um, five, five key pillars a set of principles that align with those five areas and a recognition that this is a journey with varying degrees of maturity. Melissa. 
Okay, thank you, Del. That's really distilled down to its clear points, Project 13. Um, so we're now going to take questions, um, so please submit them through the instant messaging function. Um, but I'm actually going to click off with the first question for you. Um, so you've spoken now about the principles and the theory behind Project 13, um, but there are seven early adopters who are already putting the principles into practice. So are you able to give us an update on how they're getting on? Hi. Seven early adopters. A uh, couple, couple, of points, couple of points about what's really good about those seven early adopters is uh, they all start from a different place. So that they um, they represent a cross section of our industry uh, with, with different environments, different contexts. They start different places in terms of maturity, um, but they're all applying Project 13 to all or part of their program. So, you know, for me, one of the really important points is this is just a huge learning opportunity and, and as those organizations adopt project 13 they are learning an awful lot and, and, and they're helping to develop the, the, the whole approach around project 13 um, and what's really important is that we now all collectively get to, to, to benefit from that learning and we play it back to the industry um, in terms of your question how are they getting on i mean well i mean they, they start in different places but um both individually and as a group um, you know, they're, they're making real progress and you know, the key point to me is that they are learning an awful lot in a short space of time. Okay, and here we've got a question here that sort of seems to follow up a little bit on that. In practice, within the early adopters, how has the market reacted and how have internal stakeholders accepted the differences in approach and resisted reverting to type? <laughs> what a good question. Um, so, so I think the, the, the market response has been been really encouraging in a number of respects. So, so I think it's fair to say that um, you know our industry wants to work differently. And while I touched on the fact that, that you know one of the real challenges here was for owners in being prepared to, to use different approaches and different principles, the whole response of the industry has been, I think, hugely encouraging. And, and a lot of what's driving Project 30 is coming from that broad base. So, so both generally and in terms of the early adopters. Um, the, the response of the industry has, has been hugely encouraging. Um, but both in terms of helping to drive and promote Project 13, but also holding owners to account when we, speaking as an owner, when, when we, we maybe don't you know, adopt the principles in the way that was first anticipated. So, you know, I think we can already see the industry adding to some collective peer pressure about how Project 13 should be developed and how it should go forward. Um, in terms of the internal stakeholders, I mean, that's a really good question. And, you know, the response is probably different in all of those organisations. Um, I mean, what I would say is, you know, internally, then we face a whole bunch of cultural challenges because in the end we are talking about fundamentally changing the way we work. And, you know, I touched on one aspect when I talked about, you know, moving away from traditional client contractor type behaviors into business to business relationships. I mean, you know, that, that challenges all sorts of existing practices, approaches, um, and, and will inevitably, therefore, you know, it, it'll be met with a behavioral response. So uh, I wouldn't underplay the, the change and the challenge that all of those early adopters are going through, including, you know, managing their own internal change process. I think what's really encouraging is that they all know that and, and they're all up for it. Um, so a slightly different one. Is Project 13 talking to regulators? Oh, I've just lost the question. Uh, talking to regulators and institutions to help steer to help steer um, business strategy and procurement away from transactional capex. Sorry, I keep using the question. Focus decision making towards enterprise thinking and how is the message being received? Uh, so take the regulator piece first. So uh, a number of key regulators were involved in, in developing the Project 13 uh, approach. They were involved in that research stage and with some really good representation from regulators on some of the initial work stream groups. So in general terms, uh, you know, I think we've seen a positive response. I think, I think it's not easy for all regulators to advocate and promote an approach um, depends which regulatory model they're working in so you know 
I'm not sure all of them could march out there and say we want to be work, we want you to be using Project 13. Uh, we, we are seeing a really good partnering approach from the institutions, and actually Project 13 is in itself a partnership with the ICE. Um, so, so there's no doubt that that's added both to um, Project 13's credibility and, and, and helped us to create connections into government. Uh, when it comes to government sponsors, again, you know, I think we've seen a really positive response, and I don't have any doubt that um, at the highest level, Project 13 is supported. Um, the challenge for us over the next few years is to get that through all decision-making levels. So the Project 13 isn't seen as a different approach. It is seen as the best practice approach. And clearly in that respect, you know, we, 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 we've got some way to go. But that, that's the aim. You know, we want to get to the point where Project 13 isn't seen as different. It's seen as the best practice approach. And as a journey, which are the key principles that need to be applied first to unblock and address issues and enable change to occur? For example, do we need to get the commercial models first? That's another really good question. Um, I, I, I believe that if there's a starting point for Project 13, it, it is the shift to outcomes. So if, if we move our models to one where rather than engaging organisations to deliver scope or deliver work, we engage to deliver outcomes, then some of the other principles start to fall into place. So if you're going to do that, then you have to define value at outcome level. You have to be prepared to engage at outcome level. That means your procurement can no longer be around um, scope and work and, and, and competition for that. It has, it has to be more capability based. So. Um, outcomes would be the starting point for me. I mean, it sounds just too simple, doesn't it? But, you know, part, part of what we're trying to break away from in this traditional transactional approach is just an emphasis on, on work and scope and specification into understanding the outcomes that we actually want to deliver. So, yeah, define outcomes, create alignment at outcome level and engage at outcome level, and I think the rest starts to flow from there including the commercial models and how we, we then see reward being generated. Okay, so what contractual arrangements can be used for an effective enterprise and what contracts are the early adopters using? So uh, I guess a couple of points there. So I think one thing we should be careful about is, is, is to not get drawn into thinking the Project 30 is a contract. Um, it's a set of principles, and it's an approach and there are a number of forms of contract that can be used to support an enterprise model. So what, what, one, may, maybe one of the things that we'll look to do over the next 12 months is get some of the main contracts to develop guidelines about how you use that particular form of contract in an enterprise approach. But what we don't at this stage need is a different contract for enterprises. Um, it, 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 it really is, it's, a, it's an approach, it's a set of principles, um, and it's about working differently. It's not about a different form of contract. Uh, in, in answer to the second part of the question, um, most of them are using either uh, a form of NEC or an internally developed contract. So across the early adopters, you've got both approaches, um, NEC or something internally developed. Okay. Um, what do you see as the greatest barrier to the required change? So I think there's, there's probably two, and, and, and we've touched on them. So. Uh, one of the barriers is, is our previous notion of procurement and how we see procurement and how we measure value. So, you know, if, if, if we can't move on from seeing that value is only represented through the, some form of competition around scope of work, it becomes very difficult to do Project 13. And that is, you know, clearly pretty embedded in our industry. I mean, that's the way we've measured value for some period of time. and. Um, you know, that approach to procurement is, is, is one that we've, we've used over an extended period. So I see moving away from our previous approach to procurement and how we measure value has been one of the really big steps. The other is, is, is the bit about risk. And it, it does appear to be a fairly specific and granular part of the project setting principles. Uh, but again, it has the potential to be a real blocker if, if we don't move away from seeing risk as something that's to be transferred. And then this isn't just a, a client partner thing. You know, this is about how we transfer risk right throughout the ecosystem. Unless we move away from, from seeing that as something to be transferred, again, that becomes a real blocker. So those are probably the two, the two parts of our existing practice 
that have the potential to block the progress of Project 13. Um, a fairly traditional approach to procurement and a, a, a desire to transfer risk. Okay, so and are there any Project 13 delivery models that underpin the core principles and support teams in the adoption of Project 13 on programs and projects? So, but by that I think the question is, are there any current enterprise models out there? Um, so there, there are there are some that that, that come close. I, I don't think anybody would claim to be working in a mature, high-performing enterprise, but there are some very successful integrated models that that represent many of the principles of Project Thirteen. And what's what what's unarguable, I think is that those models are delivering a higher level of performance than our traditional approach you know which which is the whole bit about sharing best practice at the outset of project 13. so i don't think anybody would claim to be a mature high performing enterprise i think you know, we're all on a journey but there are very clearly some examples out there where working in more integrated engaged models is delivering higher levels of performance both from from a an owner perspective and a partner perspective. This is probably quite a similar question. Has anyone developed a route map of who has to do what to adopt Project 13? Uh, good question. So there, there is a route map for Project 13, but it, but it, it, it probably is a little too generic. And it, it, I think that's one of the things that would be good in the next 12 months is to maybe look at um, how does that route map break down to responsibilities of different parts of the industry as, as we make progress. But there, but there is a route map for Project 13. Okay. Um, so slightly different, what level of digital capability are you finding in own organisations assessed against Project 13? Um, so there is actually, um, the, the, the Infrastructure Client Group has undertaken a digital maturity assessment. So all of the, uh, the owners around the table have undertaken that maturity assessment. So uh, it's not something I can share here, but, but we, we, we do know where we all start in terms of digital maturity. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And, you know, again, as part of that best practice sharing, we're, we're, we're trying to hold up the examples of progress to share them and, and produce some sort of, you know, more collective response to digital. The, the, the reason why that's so important is, you know, the, the opportunity for digital is, is huge. You know, we, we talk about digital all the time in, in various initiatives and in various forms, but even, even in doing so, we're probably completely underestimating the scale of opportunity and change. And it's, it's change that's, that's rapid, uh, bottom up and organic. And, and the, the reason we've got a real focus on the digital transformation initiative within ICG is about you know, our, our collective ability to respond to that change. And, and to to manage that change internally. So if, it made fantastic, exciting stuff, but it, it's really going to test our ability to manage change and to translate it into opportunity. And, and you know, the ICG working collectively on that is a really positive step. Um, so that there are some real exemplars out there. And as one example, it, you know, probably when we started talking about digital twins for infrastructure, you know, a number of years ago, we probably all dismissed it as some future notion. There are some really good examples of digital twins being used as part of an end-to-end -end delivery process now, um, you know, again, which demonstrates just how quickly the whole digital piece is progressing. Yeah, and we can circulate the link to that. To yeah, we get to do that. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a very different kind of question. Has anyone retrofitted the Project 13 principles into a large project? Oh, I mean that's a good question. <clears throat> so, so two, there are two parts to that answer. So, so yes, um, some of the early adopters uh, are looking to apply Project 13 principles into an existing program, while their primary focus is on on, on future work. So, as a formal early adopter, they're focused on future work, but they've said actually there's an opportunity to apply these principles now, um, and, and then learn as we do so. Uh, the one thing I would say, uh, and where that's been done, it's been done effectively, but there is, a, there is a challenge in doing that. I mean, Project 13 is a different way of working. And what you can do is just overlay a set of principles on an organisation or a setup that has been designed to work a different way. So as a simple example, if collaboration is part of a Project 13 approach, uh, you, you can't just require 
or request collaboration as an overlay onto an existing model. You have to create the conditions for collaboration, the environment for collaboration, and you know, all, all the parts of, of an aligned relationship that, that enable it. So there are some, but the reason I stress the second bit is it, it, it is difficult and fraught with risk to just try and overlay different principles on something that was set up to work differently. Which is why most of the early adopters are those that are embarking on um, major programs or projects. They can make those changes from the outset, not part way through. Um, what type of organisation is best placed to perform the role as the integrator? <laughs> so, um, a re another really important point, and I did touch on it, um, the, the integrator isn't, isn't meant to be a company. And in any program or project where there's a degree of complexity, then the anticipation is that, that an integrator will be formed by bringing together the right capabilities. So, so I'm, I'm probably not going to answer the question directly because an integrator should get you from, you know, developing a solution to deliver those outcomes and, and then translating that solution into production systems that underpin delivery. And it's a set of capabilities. So what an owner should be going through, and this is what a number of the early adopters have done really effectively, is say, what capabilities do we need in order to, um, to, to bring together an integrator for this program? And then they've used that to inform their selection process. Um, and in doing so, they've identified which are the right partners to, 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 to come together in that integrator. So, so it's not a direct answer to the question because you know, that might be slightly different in each situation, but the really key point is going through a process, we understand the capabilities you need to deliver those outcomes that can get you from solution to, to the production system, and then you bring the right organisations together to, to, to form that integrator. The only, the, only, the only possible circumstance where an integrator might be a company is in a you know, more limited project or programme where the complexity isn't that great and all those capabilities can be found within one organisation. Touch on that. Yeah, no, I wondered if you wanted to. These are the actual capabilities um, from Anglian that um, they actually use. So, this is from um, the early adopters, um, the actual um, program that they're working on. Um, and you can see on the left, those, those were their outcomes. And on the right, those are the capabilities that they procured on. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that they weren't what they expected to be in the integrator. Um, because it's more about, because it's such a long-term relationship, it's more about setting up the right behaviours and culture um, and the right people to find the solutions to the issues that you're going to have, um, as opposed to the actual thing that you're building. Yeah. Now, I'm going to move on to which I think is going to be a favourite of yours, Dale, actually. Um, can we learn from the manufacturing industry about standard production using technology, e.g. just-in-time management? So, uh, so we can learn a lot from... Uh, and, and have already learned a lot from those sectors. Um, so we can learn a lot from manufacturing about uh, its approach to standardized components and, and how it sees solutions formed from product and components. Uh, we, we can learn a lot from how manufacturing then uh, translate that into processes that, that underpin its delivery. Um, and with that will then come you know, the, the point about lean, continuous improvement and logistics. So, you know, Project 13, if, you, if, if we develop the right integration capability, if we do start to underpin construction with real production systems, then you know, we will start to see something that does look more like manufacturing. And again, within the exemplars, um, there were some really good examples of this. And there are some really good examples in our industry now with you know, complex solutions that are effectively made up of uh, pre-developed digital products and components, and where the solution development is much more about integrating those products and components to, to, into um, finished solutions. And when they go, those go through delivery, um, you see something that looks very different. I mean, it's about intelligent Lego bricks, products, components, whatever you want to say, being, being integrated in something that does look far more like manufacturing than traditional um, construction. So, so we've got some exemplars that really point point away here. I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we will have to move away from as part of that is our tendency to see everything as unique, different and special. 
and you know for too long our project by project approach has, has convinced us that everything we do is unique and it's for the first time and the reality is that everything we do is has some degree of repeatability in it and and it does lend itself to thinking more about standard product standard process standard work so yes actually leading from that possibly is how do we ensure we can get common values to deliver the right outcomes um so so I, I hesitate because I don't, I don't think there's a need to drive common values. Um, you, know, you know, one of the things that uh, some of those exemplars demonstrated was that they brought together organisations that, in terms of values, culture, and behaviour, were very different. But that's what it, what what made them incredibly effective and creative was actually the, you know, the, the bringing together of those different perspectives. So uh, uh, we're not trying to align values because in the end, you know, if you follow that to its ultimate conclusion, you're just trying to align everybody with the owner's values and, and you end up with something that's uniform and probably not very effective. What we're trying to align is outcomes. So you know, we're trying to create alignment about why we're all being brought together, why we're working collectively and outcomes the bit that represent that alignment. So it, it, it's a quite complex area um, and, and you know, going from from outcome through value, through culture, through behaviour. But what we're not trying to do is to force some alignment of owner values onto an enterprise. What we're actually trying to do is to bring together organisations that that um, you know, give us access to a broad set of values and therefore offer you know more capability. Okay, so we're going to have to wrap up soon, so I've got the last few questions. So, um, from the early adopters' experience, what is the recommended timescale to set up a Project 13 approach to a new programme? Uh, so, so I, I wouldn't have an absolute answer on that. I think that if you distilled the experience, then probably something around 12 to 18 months. Um, but that's, that's not just about Project 13, I, mean, I, you know, I, th I think any... any program if you're going to underpin it with the right relationships with aligned business to business relationships if you're going to engage with partners early you're probably going to, going to need an 18 to 18 months to 12 month period before you actually think about delivering work um, to get all that set up the right way so so i don't think there's a specific answer but but there is a bit of learning that if you look at um some of those integrated models then they they, they, they started their development process probably 18 months before the start of the project. So I'm going to sort of bunch the last three together because I think they'll probably look forward to, to the next steps. So um, one of them um, is um, got a comment as well as a question. So outcomes and value focus is often difficult from an industry that are used to deliverables, EVM and outputs. Tangible outputs are needed by most to manage. How can we educate and improve and what are your thoughts on this? And then another one is, um, uh, how can we pass on lessons learned from Project 13 effectively? And another one is, is there any learning being brought across from similar experiments across the globe, such as Alliance in Australia and Lean Integrated Project Delivery in the US? So you bundle three together to have a feeling bundle three, so remind me of them as we go through. So on the first one, um, so I completely agree that, that that is one of the you know fundamental shifts. We talked about that. Um, one of the things we're, we're, we're trying to do is to get uh, government sponsors and owners to to talk about outcomes and to expect outcomes and and, and, and to not let us uh, you know just march off thinking about deliverables and tangible stuff. So so as part of enabling that change. If we've got those constituent groups asking about outcomes, you know, wanting to understand how outcomes are being delivered, helping us to hold on to outcomes as we go through the delivery process, then I think we start to, to, to hopefully enable change across the industry. But but I completely agree with the premise. You know, the, the challenge there is we're all more comfortable with tangible engineering and program metrics. Um, second one. So it's all kind of about lessons learned and um, things going across the globe and how we can so sort of bring all the lessons yeah, learned yeah. together and sort of help to... So, so in terms of lessons learned, to, to, I, I guess that's the real challenge for Project 13 as we go forward. I mean, there are you know, such great 
lessons been learned. There's, there's, there's learning been generated both by the formal early adopters, but also by a number of informal early adopters. Um, the, the, the real challenge for Project 13 is, and it goes right back to where I started, um, consolidating that learning uh, and, and then playing it back to the rest of the industry. And if we do that, then we'll accelerate you know, the pace of change for all of us. So uh, that that's really the primary focus of Project 13 is to, to sustain that learning process. Um, in terms of whether we've learned from others, I mean, we, we, we did um, try and incorporate the Australian alliancing experience into some of our early work. And it's interesting that one of our formal early adopters now is Sydney Water. So we sort of come full circle there. And again, Sydney are really looking to adopt the enterprise model for their program. Um, and we did similarly with some of the integrated delivery team work from, from the States. Um, and we also continue, as was mentioned in the previous question, to work with other sectors, um, in, including automotive, to understand again how we incorporate their lessons into our approach going forward. So yeah, it is the learning process. The challenge for us is sustaining that and making sure we progress as an industry. So there are lots and lots of questions, but I think we're going to have to uh, close there. So it's just left for me to thank you very much, Dale. Um, and um, you can continue to send through your questions and we'll see if we can get back to you.